Oh, okay. Uh, so, <coughs> Nectarina is an assistant professor uh, at the Institute for Logic, Language and Communication at the University of Amsterdam. Her research is in the area of niche language processing with a specific uh, focus on computational semantics, security of language processing, uh, multilingual NLP, and cognitively driven semantics. Previously, she worked at the University of Cambridge Computer Laboratory and the International Computer Science Institute and the Institute for Cognitive and Brain Sciences at the University of California, Berkeley. She received her PhD in computer science from the University of Cambridge at, uh, in uh, 2011. Welcome to the Thank you very much for the introduction and for having me. So I'll be talking to you today about uh, some of our very recent work. Um, actually, this is, um, you know, this experiment sort of somewhat work in progress. So any questions or comments or feedback uh, would be very welcome. Um, okay, so um, let me start um, uh, by saying a few words on what metaphor actually is. And if you look at the image uh, on the screen, does it tell you anything about politics? No. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yes. Just a little bit more. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> it does. Well, in a sense, it does, right? It's a, it's a complex system which has uh, multiple interconnected parts. It has, you know, all those wheels that can set other wheels into motion can be well designed or it can be badly designed, can be well oiled or it could be rusty, just like political systems or political processes, right? And uh, in fact, this metaphor is quite um, commonly used in language. And so we can talk about rebuilding a campaign machinery or taking steps towards working democracy or mending foreign policy um, and so on. Um, now, how does metaphor work? Um, well, the most, um, Influential explanation of this has been um, uh, offered to us by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson uh, in their conceptual metaphor theory. And uh, Lakoff and Johnson um, essentially explain uh, metaphor through the presence of uh, systematic associations between distinct concepts or domains, so two distinct concepts or domains, uh, such as, for instance, political system, which we call the target domain, is uh, systematically associated with mechanism which uh, they call the source domain, right? And um, the presence um, of this association allows us to project um, uh, knowledge and inferences across semantic domains and allows us to reason about politics uh, um, in, terms of, in terms of mechanism. And essentially the metaphorical language that we observe on the surface is a reflection of this underlying association and inference process. Um, now, uh, in addition to um, this theoretical work on metaphor, there has also been very interesting experimental work on metaphor and particularly on its um, relationship with uh, emotion, right? And so there's been a range of experiments um, from, you know, such areas as uh, linguistic annotation, um, behavioral experimentation, uh, all the way to neuroscience. Uh, and essentially, um, many of these studies have uh, suggested that um, uh, that metaphorical language uh, generally tends to be more emotionally evocative than literal language. Right, and so uh, in um, one such study, which was actually a collaboration of mine with Nathan Comments from uh, uh, NRC Canada, uh, some of you uh, know him, um, so in this, this was a linguistic annotation study uh, where we um, had, uh, well, we looked at uh, metaphors that are expressed by uh, verbs, so the verbs that are used uh, metaphor in the metaphorical context. Then we also looked at the uses of the same verb in their literal context. And then we also looked at uh, the literal paraphrases of the metaphor, right? So we had these three sets of sentences. Uh, so such as, I can't buy this story, I can't believe this story, and the sum, the sum will buy you a ride on the train, right? And then what we did is we, in, in, in uh, two steps, we collected human judgments as to whether the use of a verb in this sentence is literal or metaphorical, and, um, uh, and then in the second step as to whether, whether um, the subjects perceive uh, the sentence as 
uh, neutral or <coughs> emotional, right? Um, and, uh, and then, so these were different groups of subjects, by the way. And what we have found that there is indeed, um, seems to be a very strong um, correlation between the same sentences, um, the, the use of being metaphorical and them uh, expressing some emotion. And what's really interesting about it, this seems to be not um, so much the property of uh, just the words themselves, such as, you know, there's nothing um, about by that makes it, you know, intrinsically more emotional than other than other words, right? And there's also uh, uh, there's also not so much, you know. So if you look at, I can't believe this story. Uh, it's not that, you know, the statement itself, you know, expresses um, a very strong, like the the actual fact underlying the statement expresses um, a lot of emotion. However, what happens is when you know the word is used metaphorically, then suddenly through this metaphorical use of this neutral word in the context, um, some emotion arises, right? Then uh, there has also been um, interesting research uh, on this uh, from the neuroscience community. Um, and Francesca Zitron and her colleagues um, have conducted an fMRI study, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, where uh, they um, so they had uh, uh, their subjects read um, short stories, and um, and it was a while they were in the scanner, and they were, these were really short stories, something like a paragraph, I believe, and um, and then um, what they found is that uh, metaphorical language in the stories generally uh, elicited a stronger activation in uh, the brain areas that are related to emotion processing than literal language did. So uh, the shells, this shows something that we can actually observe in the brain. So this is, you know, so these are very interesting results. However, we don't know yet uh, very much. So we know that their metaphorical language uh, does evoke a stronger emotion. We don't know much uh, about the mechanism by which this happens, right? It happens somehow through somatic composition. We don't know much about um, this mechanism. So. I'm not saying that I'm going to answer this question in this talk. I'm just saying that this is something that's interesting to uh, ponder. But what will I? Uh, what I will um, uh, be talking about is our uh, recent computational experiments, where we have built a computational model, um, a joint computational model of uh, metaphor and emotion, aiming to um, um, Aiming to model, essentially aiming to model their interaction in the process of sentence representation learning. Was there a question here? Uh, yes. Those two edits with regard. Yeah. 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 So it's more surprising in a sense. Uh, yeah. I mean, this could be. I think nobody has measured this, as far as I'm aware. You know, we haven't actually measured this. This is uh, this is interesting. I mean, I guess the 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 one caveat though is that you know when you actually uh, you know when you take uh, the metaphors and you try to paraphrase them with literal paraphrases or sort of very conventional uh, metaphorical paraphrases is actually quite difficult and um, to do and there you know because inevitably you'll be missing out on some aspects of the meaning such as the emotion right um, so and there's no it's not necessarily the one correct way of paraphrasing um, every I mean there might be different you know possible ways of paraphrasing a particular metaphor so this is generally an experiment that would be quite difficult to conduct i think though not impossible you know if you had a paraphrasing data set but it's not always such a clear-cut case with uh, like believe this story uh like buy and believe this story so um i mean in principle yes so this is an interesting hypothesis and i think the mm, there could be some correlation with sort of the emotionality and the surprisal you know that you have uh, when you see the word. Um, so, in that sense, uh, yes, maybe, but I think that, yeah, nobody has met. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay. Um, okay, so today I'll be talking actually about two different research projects, um, a little bit more about the first one and about the second one. Um, and so the first one is uh, where 
as I mentioned, we have built a joint model of uh, metaphor and emotion aiming to investigate uh, their interaction in uh, sentence representation learning. So kind of approaching um, composition in that way, but um, using neural models. And then the second one is our uh, also our recent work uh, where we use a general purpose um, uh, data-driven semantic models, so uh, word and sentence representations to try and better understand um, uh, human processing of metaphor, uh, so how metaphor is processed in the human brain. Okay, so the, this um, first experiment, so this is the work of my student, Verna Dunker, so it's a picture you see here, and uh, so she's the main contributor. And um, so we model the interaction of um, metaphor and emotion in a multitask learning framework. And the two tasks which uh, we combine are the metaphor identification and emotion prediction tasks. Now, uh, for the metaphor identification um, tasks, the task is essentially, uh, you know, annotate linguistic expressions as to whether, you know, they're literal or metaphorical. And we use uh, two different corpora. Uh, here's the first one is the View Amsterdam Metaphor Corpus, which is, um, well, it's the largest one and it's um, probably the most commonly used um, uh, corpus in, in the metaphor research uh, today, in the computational metaphor <coughs> research. So it contains uh, word level annotation um, of metaphorical language. So basically for each word, you know, you have annotations, whether it's used metaphorically or literally in the given context. Um, and we treat it as a sequence labeling task. Um, and the data in the View Amsterdam Corpus comes from the BNC, the British National Corpus, so it's sort of general domain data. Uh, now, the second corpus that we use is the LCC Metaphor Corpus, which uh, I believe actually was uh, created in collaboration with uh, researchers at ISI here um, at some point. And, uh, and so this is, it's different, so the, the, the data comes from political debates, so it's more limited domain corpus from the politics domain. And um, it contains sentence level annotation, so each sentence is annotated as to how likely is it that it contains a metaphor with a score. Um, and uh, we treat it as a, um, a regression, regression task, so predicting the score uh, at the sentence level. And so we run, we experiment with these two corporates separately. So the, the Amsterdam corpus is binary. It is or it isn't. Yeah, so it's it's labels, yeah, literal and metaphor. Yeah. Do you know what? Do you know anything about the annotation standards there and how they Sorry? Do you know anything about the annotation standards and what they consider the threshold of metaphor or Well, it's kind of um, it's it's sort of leaning towards including some very conventionalized metaphors. So this is kind of a property of it. I think they it was very um uh, so they had very high agreement in the, um, you know, in that sort of in the, in the paper they reported very high internet data agreement, much higher than you know we got in any of our experiments on metaphor, uh, and um, and I think part of the reason for so their aim was to get you know high quality annotations with a very high agreement, things like kappa 0.8 or something, which is extremely high, right, for a semantic task, but the way they got to it is by using a dictionary. So basically, the annotators were asked, you know, to use the sense definitions from the dictionary, and then they had a procedure um, for distinguishing between, uh, you know, sort of what they call the more basic sense, which is, you know, more physical, is historically older, and so on. So there was a set of um, uh, definitions uh, uh, versus, you know, kind of any other sense, right, which they considered metaphorical. Um, so and and to define the senses, they use dictionaries. So. Um, they, as a result of this, uh, they had, you know, the human judges had sort of less space for judgment, in a sense, um, right? Um, and uh, um, and so they, you know, they got they got this very reliable, uh, very reliable annotation. Uh, but as a result of it, as well, they ended up including a lot of highly conventionalized metaphors as metaphors. So um, I think. Um, be a good example. So um, I think one metaphor there is so there's something like I will show you that I trust you or something like that where show was annotated as a metaphor. So this is an extreme case but it does contain even you know some highly conventionalized metaphors like this. So this is uh, you know this is kind of a special property of this corpus and I think I'm also interested in historical aspects 
uh, of metaphor and how it develops. So that's why their annotation was focused on this. Um, and um, however, it also captures the more creative metaphors. So this is actually what I'm also experimenting with the LCC metaphor corpus because it tended to generally focus on um, kind of the more creative, more interesting, more striking metaphors. Uh, but it is, you know, limited domain. So, so can you actually characterize all metaphor as like in terms of the recency of usage of a sense? Now, like I was thinking about horsepower, right? So like if you talk about a car's horsepower, do you mm -hmm. consider? Do you think these standards would consider that a metaphor right now? Well, the, the view Amsterdam metaphor corpus definitely. It would. Right? Uh, yeah, I think so. No, I mean, so. it's probably in the dictionary so. as a standard think... sense. Of... Well, yeah. Um, but if you talk about like, yeah. I don't know, a cake's horsepower, that's clearly metaphorical. Cake's horsepower. The energy yeah. that's like, that, it, you know, some food provides. Ah, okay, you know, okay. That is, that is more, that's yeah, that's true. That is more creative. Clearly. Yeah, that is, that is more creative. Well, that is, that is definitely, so, I mean, the truth is there is a continuum, right? right. You go from literal language to really creative mm -hmm. uh, novel metaphors, uh, right, such as the cake's horsepower. Um, and uh, and then the question really, you know, the different studies, and this actually this is true for computational experiments and for data annotation studies uh, and for linguistic studies in general, right? Uh, they differ as to where they draw the line on this continuum between literal and, and, and metaphorical, right? So the view Amsterdam corpus is kind of more on the conventionalized size, size mm -hmm. side. Um, so, and... Um, and generally, I would say, you know, in my research, I think I was also more interested in, in you know, more novel uh, creative metaphor, or at least the metaphors that, you know, can be clearly identified by, you know, sort of lay people, not even linguists, you know, as metaphorical, given the guidelines. So this is, for instance, when we did the annotation system, when Saif and I did our study on metaphor and emotion, um, you know, we used some of the guidelines from the view procedure, but, uh, you know, we made sure, you know, they didn't use the dictionary and they generally relied on their own intuition um, of what a metaphor is. And I think ultimately, you know, how you want to define it really depends on the application you have in mind, right? Uh, so if you want to, you know, look at, um, say, metaphor and the role of metaphors in reasoning, um, right, like how um, the use of particular metaphors can influence behavior, for instance, then actually you may want to look at conventionalized metaphors as well, because they tell you a lot about, uh, you know, particular viewpoints and particular ways of reasoning about concepts, right? If you want to say, for instance, okay, I want to use this to improve machine translation, then you really want to focus on the more creative metaphors because the more conventional ones, it just learns using standard MT techniques, right? So it depends what you're interested in. Um, but yeah, but these are the corpora that we have, the largest ones. So we used we used what we had. I don't know if you have an ad for a truck and it says like it's got thirty thousand joules of energy <laughs> versus it's got five horses. You know. This is a little more metaphorical yeah. power. Yeah, I mean, I think there would be like I agree that you know there would be some correlation. Yeah, yeah, I think the more conventional you go, the less emotion you might induce. Though, I mean, I can't buy this story. It's also kind of commonly used, but it is clear to you and me and hopefully John that it is a that it is a metaphor, right? That it is not a literal sense of buy, right? So it is uh, it is kind of so that's the thing. There is a continue. There are conventional metaphors that are still sort of surprising and have uh, you know just evoke a greater eff effect, I guess. Uh, Whatever, um, whatever that is in in this in uh, the listener. So, but I do think that you know the more creative and striking the metaphor, the stronger reaction you're going to have um, in terms of you know also in terms of emotions, but also in terms of reasoning. Right? You would need actually, and people have shown that for novel metaphors, um, readers of texts are using eye tracking studies. Readers Texts do uh, spend, you know, the, the, do exhibit higher, pro longer processing times. 
So basically, you know, novel metaphor does require more effort to interpret it, right? And um, the readers scan back more and so on, right, when they read. So generally, you know, if there's more processing going on, then it is likely that more of our brain systems are also employed for this. And, um, uh, and so there is just more going on, including being, um, emotion as well. So I don't know if this answers your question, but that's sort of intuition. But yeah, the truth is we don't know a lot yet about, uh, you know, the actual mechanisms by which this happens, right? Uh, that metaphor induces a stronger emotion. We just, you, we just observe that it is the case in various kinds of um, data and various kinds of studies. Um, but we don't know 100% why, but it is likely that it is related to surprisal and uh, just increased processing that is needed. And yeah, I hope so. Let's see how we go. If I uh, get to the uh, to the brain imaging exper experiment, so I'll be talking there about um, um, metaphor and grounding a little bit, and um, and I'll show you that we actually did find some interesting differences there with respect to um, metaphor and literal metaphorical and literal language, which might also relate uh, emotion in some way. Okay, so okay, these are um, uh, these are two metaphor identification tasks, right? Um, which we use kind of interchangeably in this model. And then the second task, uh, which we use is the emotion prediction task. And so here we use the uh, balance arousal uh, dominance model of emotion that was um, uh, proposed in psychology and actually is quite popular um, in psychology. And uh, the idea is that we want to represent emotion, you know, instead of the standard um, sort of more traditional categorical models of emotion where we label emotions as uh, love, anger, fear, uh, and so on. Um, here um, we define the emotional state uh, in terms of the three different aspects of emotion, uh, balance, uh, arousal, and dominance. And so balance uh, essentially uh, stands for the polarity, you know, is the emotion negative or positive? Um, then arousal stands for um, the uh, degree of excitement, you know, so how uh, excited, how aroused is the person about this negative or positive emotion, right? And then dominance uh, stands for the perceived uh, degree of control over the situation, <coughs> right? So does the person feel in control and strong, or does the person feel um, sort of weak and subject to um, something? So to give you um, a little bit more intuition of how um, you know, how the dimensions really play out in actual sentences and actual language. I have a few examples here, so they're a bit small. Actually, I was hoping for a larger um, screen, but I'll read them out to you. Uh, so, for instance, the sentence uh, such as, tell her, told her I love her. We're going to have a, a very high balance. So here's point 94, a very high, so it's clearly positive, very high arousal score. The person is clearly excited and a very high dominance score as well. The person is in control, right? For a sentence such as tell me or I'll kill, uh, pretty low balance, right? So sentence, uh, really high arousal and also very high dominance. Um, what did you say is a, a neutral sentence. Here, though, it can also be different, different contexts, I guess, but it's annotated as neutral and you have neutral balance, uh, neutral arousal and neutral dominance. Uh, for a sentence such as this is torture, uh, you would have a very low balance, uh, you would have a high arousal, and uh, you would have a very low dominance. The person is clearly not um, in control. And so the corpus which we use for this is called the Imobank corpus, which is a recent, um, is a recent corpus. And um, essentially every sentence uh, in this corpus is annotated with uh, its valence arousal dominance score. And uh, we model the task as, an, uh, as a regression task. Again, so for each sentence, we want to predict uh, its score in each of the dimensions of emotion. Yeah? Um, okay, so, uh, we, so we built the joint model of the two tasks, the metaphor and emotion task. And, um, uh, in, and so we use multitask learning to do this. And in terms of the architecture, so we experiment with two types of encoders. Uh, we use an LSTM with Elmo and Glove embeddings uh, as input, and we also use BERT, pre-trained BERT. Um, and 
Now, in uh, multitask learning, there are different ways in which you can uh, share parameters between your models, um, right? So you could, the more traditional ways to use what is called the hard parameter sharing, where essentially you really use the same encoder or parts of the encoder for both tasks, right? So all the parameters are the same uh, and, you know, you train it for both, you know, to perform both, both tasks at the same time. Uh, and then um, another option is to use a, a soft parameter sharing, where essentially you would use uh, two separate encoders, or so one encoder for each task, and then uh, you would uh, uh, use some way of sharing information between the two encoders, so some way of letting the information flow um, between the two encoders of both of the tasks, right? So this gives us quite a bit more flexibility because essentially <coughs> the model can then learn uh, what, you know, how much information it should take, you know, for from sort of from task B for task A and, and the other way around, right? And um, and essentially, uh, the, the other important thing to say about the general setup is that we, um, uh, what we do is we do not treat both tasks equally, but instead we um, treat one as a main task uh, and the other one as an auxiliary task, which uh, you know is meant to help in the learning of the main task. Okay, so hard parameter sharing um, is uh, really a very simple model. So we have our, so this is a picture from the LSTM case, and we have um, uh, our word embeddings, so GLAD, LAB, and ELMO. Uh, and then we have, um, actually we have two uh, shared layers of um, uh, by LSTM. And uh, then we have, um, so these are optimized together for the two tasks, right? And then we have, uh, uh, one task specific layer for each of the tasks, right? So this is say metaphor and then this is emotion. Um, and uh, essentially then for, you know, for the metaphor task, it's a sequence labeling task in case of the view corpus. Um, and essentially uh, then the hidden representations from the last task specific layer are then fed to binary softmax classifier. Um, and outputting a label, literal a metaphor for every word. And then uh, for the emotion task, it's a sentence level uh, prediction task. So we use an attention mechanism to combine the hidden representations. And then we use a sigmoid to uh, predict the score. Right, so this is the setup for the LCC corpus, the metaphor task. Basically this last bit is the same as here. Right, so that's the only, that's the only difference now. Um, so for BERT, uh, the idea is essentially the same, except we take, so we experiment with BERT base, and uh, we take the pre-trained model and then we fine tune it for both tasks, right? And, and what we do is the same thing with, you know, the last uh, kind of the top layer of BERT would be fine tuned in a task specific way, right? So we would have uh, one for metaphor and one for motion and all the other bottom layers are shared, right? So this is the hard sharing setup. Um, and the rest uh, is the same, except for the, the input embeddings are also different for BERT. So um, we have experimented with BERT uh, only in this hard parameter sharing so far, so I will present results uh, for that. And for the next two setup we on, setups, we only used LSTM. And so the um, uh, first uh, self parameter sharing setup that we've experimented is the cross-stitch network, the so called cross-stitch network. So I know the image looks a little bit uh, cluttered, but I will explain. Um, so essentially, uh, we have you know so we have two enco separate encoders for each of the tasks, right? These are bio STM encoders, and then at each layer, you know we want to share some information between the two tasks. And the way we do them by do this is by introducing this uh, cross stitch units, right? So this is essentially a two by two matrix of weights. So these are called the alpha weights. And uh, so at each layer, you have a different uh, set of weights. And um, and and so the four weights essentially what they indicate is for task A. So this will be alpha A A. It would just tell you how much information from that layer you. Um, you keep from task A, and then alpha uh, BA tells you how much information at this uh, level you should import from task B, right? And essentially, 
The thin representation, uh, which will be passed on to the next layer, is going to be a weighted sum of the hidden representation of the encoder in task A and the hidden representation of the encoder in task B for that word. Right, so it's it's a very very simple model. Does that make sense? So at every um, cell or at every uh, hidden representation, this is all RNNs, right? Uh, all yes, yes, it's all LSTMs, and this is done at every word, basically, at every yeah hidden representation, at, every at time the, step. At the at the H and the C, like you're not going inside the LSTM. No, 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 it's just the H, yeah, just for the H, and then this is the H that's passed on. Yeah, you know, you don't go inside the cell. No. And then is, the, like in your uh, diagram, it looks like the embeddings are shared across tasks, is that true? The embeddings are shared across tasks, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And actually, I don't think we fine-tune them, I think we just... Uh, ah, the embeddings are fine-tuned, though. I think, well, we experimented with, uh, you know, a few different options, but I think the final option in which we tell presenting the results for, they're not fine-tuned. Yeah. So the alphas are uh, uh, the alphas are learned uh, in the tasks, right? So it, you know, for, for each task combination, it will learn how much information it should share, and for each layer, uh, and there are three layers actually. So that if you put all three, then the diagram looks uh, even more confusing. Um, but in our final results, we have uh, three layers here, and uh, we initialize the alphas with a bias towards a, a particular, like towards the task itself. So basically something like 0.9 versus 0.1, right? And then we update them in training. So, okay, does this make sense? Yeah, set up? Okay, great. Um, so now, um, this is nice because it does allow us uh, to learn how much information we want to take from, you know, the auxiliary task for the main task. Um, but it does have one um, deficiency in that, um, when the alphas are learned, once the alphas are learned, uh, when the training is finished, at test time, uh, the alphas are going to remain fixed, you know, for any sentence. So for any word, any sentence, we're going to take as much, you know, the same amount of information from task B for task A. However, you know, how much information about emotion we may want to take, you know, for metaphor processing might depend on, you know, a particular word and a particular context in which it is used. So, in order to model that, or in order to allow the model a bit more flexibility uh, at test time, we also uh, introduce um, a, a gated network where essentially instead of using alphas to combine the two hidden representations uh, from the two tasks, we use gates, right? So we basically learn a gating function and then uh, that acts as a filter telling us how much information from in representation from task B should you know be passed on um, and should be combined with a hidden representation for task A and passed on to the upper layers, right? So essentially, um, it's you know there is a gate um, between every correspondent hidden representation, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. And so um, and what's nice then you know the the uh, the gating vector that is constructed would then depend on the actual word and the actual context at test time. Okay, so these are our three models, and these are the results. It's like a lot of numbers through them. Uh, so we've tested, you know, we've compared these different ways of sharing information. Uh, and so we'll first present the results uh, for the metaphor task. However, we also evaluated it for the emotion task as well. And so we have here uh, the current state of the art on the View Amsterdam corpus. Uh, is a recent uh, model of <coughs> um, an LSTM, which is very similar to our uh, single task uh, LSTM model, which is basically just LSTM encoder without emotion layers. Um, and, uh, and so these are the results. This is kind of our baseline, uh, just a single task LSTM. And then we want to see how much information the emotion task contributes in the joint learning setup. And, uh, and so here, or hard sharing and uh, soft sharing so cross stitch and gated network. Uh, so we see that um, basically adding emotion improves performance in all of the cases, right? So the bolded numbers are statistically significant. And, um, and what's interesting, um, and then we see that so this is the these are the results. Uh, F1 is for the view Amsterdam metaphor corpus and um, and correlation, the results in terms of correlation. Um, 
the sentence level up for the LCC corpus. And um, you can see that the motion improves results in all cases. Um, and, uh, and I should have mentioned we run experiments for each dimension separately. Um, and uh, what we did find is that dominance actually appears to be uh, the, you know, the most useful dimension. In fact, in the view corpus is the only one that's significant. Uh, performance, which I think is quite interesting, um, you know, and there could be several explanations for this. Um, so one is, for instance, that you know, when we analyzed the attention patterns in the motion prediction task, we found that uh, you know, for arousal and um, and violence, what you find is that uh, the the motion patterns are very sparse. In other words, what this means is that. Um, the, you know, it focuses, it learns to focus on certain words uh, as features, as indicators of, uh, you know, high or low um, balance and arousal values. Uh, however, if we look at, um, at the dominance um, attention patterns, they're much uh, less sparse. It's really, you know, it really focuses on many words and it's possibly, you know, trying to perform more composition, semantic composition. So it could be that, um, in the dominance uh, case, basically because the task of dominance prediction, you know, predicting how much someone feels in control, is, is just a harder semantic task, which requires the model to learn richer semantic representations, which then would also be more helpful, uh, you know, for metaphor processing. So this is sort of a more technical explanation. Uh, another explanation comes from sort of more uh, um, uh, theoretical and also corpus-based work on uh, metaphor in the social sciences, where there have been studies that do suggest that metaphor is linked to uh, power and persuasion, persuasion and um, things like that, or even that it can be used sort of as a manipulation device, um, right, or persuasion device. So it could indeed be the case that, um, you know, um, metaphors, um, uh, meta metaphors and particularly more creative novel metaphors um, can be used in sentences which also exhibit a higher dominance, possibly, you know, but this is this is a speculation, of course, right, but this is, but this is the result that we see in this uh, joint learning framework. To, to be clear, what you're seeing, so you're doing your metaphor test set, feeding it through, you're, you're predicting emotion, but you don't care what the actual prediction of the emotion is right now, but the point is that... No, the, so that's when that it's used as an auxiliary task, yeah. Right. So the, yeah. Uh, and then, but do you uh, see a correlate, if there's this notion of, you know, dominance correlating with metaphor, do you actually see a prediction of dominance correlating with the prediction of... Uh, oh? So in this particular model, uh, I don't think we've um, looked at that. This is actually interesting. Um, I think the thing is because this model is not really optimized for emotion, the emotion predictions are not really, um, I mean, as they're not really as accurate as and you know an, an emotion model. Presumably, you don't actually would you have think? dominance numbers for the metaphor to ask because of different sentences, right? Um, so you don't know what the truth is. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if the opinion of the model is of it's highly dominant in the cases where the where the opinion of the model is. It's, yeah, so we haven't looked at that, but it's great actually. The student is writing her thesis at the moment. It's a master's thesis, so uh, I will tell her to do that. That is a very, very, very good advice. Yes, we haven't. Yeah, we haven't looked at it, but I would imagine it is possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you... It's not so much better. It's just kind of one point. Uh, F one. To ask which are yeah. Um, well, I guess there's an, another um, point of um, F1 here. And uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't know why the, you know, I don't know exactly, I can't remember exactly what the differences are. Um, the differences are not, um, I mean, there would be small differences in the setup. And it could be um, that in that paper they have run, so I know that we, in our experiments, we've run uh, 10 models, so 10 initializations for every model, 
right? There has been some um, variation, but it wasn't uh, very high. Uh, I don't know, I don't, can't remember exactly what these guys did in their paper. You know, it could be that this variation is due to that. I mean, and we did use exactly the same data split and everything as they did. So it is comparable. And in principle, the model should be comparable as well. Uh, it could be that we have one extra layer. Maybe they had a two layer list here and we have three because in the joint learning setup that allows us to you know, share information at more layers. Um, so the, this could be why our baseline is a little bit better. Um, but, um, you know, our baseline is the way it is so that it can be exactly comparable to the multitask learning setup. Um, I mean, the truth is also it's much easier, you know, the lower your performance, the easier it is to prove it, right? So as you get, you know, with every, with each F1 point, um, with each F1 point, it becomes harder and harder to prove it by more as well. So this is also true, but um, yeah. But also I should say that it, this is already, um, this is already a um, very strong model that we're improving on, right? So, I mean, um, this F score, yeah, 73. I mean, it is it is a high F score for a metaphor on this corpus. Um, so it's um, yeah. Sorry, it's not really uh, doesn't really answer your question, but that's kind of as best as I can answer it. Um, sorry. So balance, arousal, and dominance—they were the continuous numbers between zero and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of them were. Yeah. And uh, how do you compute F one for continuous? I mean, we can compute. No, no. This is for metaphor. This is for metaphor. This is when uh, this is the this is all tested on metaphor, and this is when you add as a, as the auxiliary task balance arousal or dominance. So this table has no meta, no no numbers for emotion, uh, so they will be coming actually. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. One more question. I think I should move on because maybe some of the questions will be answered. Uh, Not all of them at the same time. Yes, yeah, so uh, this is work in progress. So Verna will be running the experiment uh, with all of them at the same time. It is kind of a, a giant model, but uh, yeah, <laughs> there's uh, there's a lot of things to try. So she's not uh, uh, there yet. Yeah, and I would expect. And actually, there has been a paper that has shown, you know, in just the emotion task, which is multitask learning. I learn all of the emotions together, and it has shown in principle that it does improve. Uh, you know, the using all emotions together um, um, does improve over learning for each of them separately when you evaluate in individual dimensions. So it is possible that it will help a little bit. Um, yes. Although, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the balance and arousal uh, features do seem to be um, sort of it does seem to focus on specific indicators of emotion. Okay, so here uh, are just results with BERT, and then of course, uh, BERT improves quite a bit, like in all other tasks, um, over you know the LSTM uh, baseline, but then the emotion still contributes, um, and uh, it's not a very high improvement, half a point one, but uh, it's statistically significant. So, yeah. So this is these are currently this is currently a state of the art result uh, on the corpus. Uh, okay, so in terms of the performance on the emotion task, so again, these are existing approaches, and actually this is a model which was trained for all of them together, which I mentioned previously. Um, and so this is, um, again, evaluated in terms of a correlation uh, between the scores. And uh, what we see, so this is, you know, heart sharing, cross-stitch network and gated network. Um, and um, and then we add metaphor at the token level, so the view Amsterdam task and the metaphor at the sentence level. Um, and again, we see that um, basically in um, almost all cases, the performance improves, um, except for the arousal performance here, and when combined with the sentence level task. And so I have some examples coming up, which um, hopefully demonstrate what's going on. This is BERT again, and again we see um, 
quite a good improvement, quite a solid improvement with Burrett, I guess, as we have seen in many other papers um, on semantics and tasks. But again, you know, over Burrett, we're still improving by quite a bit by adding uh, by adding metaphor in the emotion process. Okay, so we have conducted uh, some qualitative analysis to see what is actually going on with the model and why we see those performance improvements that, that we do see. And, um, and so what it turns out that for metaphor, uh, when we analyzed cases where it actually improved, so when there was an error in the single task model which got corrected by the multitask model, uh, as it turns out that um, the vast majority of them when, uh, was when the literal um, case was corrected I was correct, correct. What was previously annotated as a literal was corrected um, to metaphor, right? Um, so it does seem that adding information about emotion does help uh, to increase the recall of the metaphors, essentially to uh, to find more metaphors. And so here we have some examples, and they're a bit um, hard to read. But um, so the what is in bold here. Um, are the metaphors that were previously not identified but now identified. Uh, so you see here a safety net. There is still an endless dithering on how broad a safety net Britain will extend to its citizens. And so here at safety, um, safety net is now annotated as a metaphor. So this is in case of um, arousal. In case of balance, we see a somber statement now annotated. Um, what, what's the metaphor then? I Sorry? I just think of somber as meaning sad. Do you know what? I think it's dark, actually. Uh, it's dark, and then, uh, yeah, read the rest of the original meaning. But this is the view I'm sort of metaphor corpus. This is what I mean by conventional metaphors being annotated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it comes from friends. I mean, friends is still means dark, I guess. It's probably like that in English. I wouldn't talk about entering yeah. a somber room, meaning just a dark room. No, no, that you wouldn't, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, so I'm not a native speaker, so it's a bit harder for me to to um, uh, uh, to judge, um, you know, how the, the original literal sense could be used or could not be used. Um, and it often, you know, I mean, I, I realize often that, you know, for some words, I learned the metaphorical meaning first, and then uh, at some point I discover, oh, oh, they have this literal meaning. How interesting, you know. And uh, so it's a bit hard for me to judge, but uh, I think this is what, you know. I'm pretty sure this is where the original meaning comes from, from French. And um, yeah, and it's probably in the dictionary which the, the VU metaphor corpus was, uh, uh, was using, uh, the VU metaphor annotation people were, were using. So, but yeah, uh, I think uh, means dark. And then uh, for dominance, uh, we have here in a bare mud walled cell sitting on the floor is stepilit. Uh, so here, bare. Um, was annotated as a metaphor, corrected to a uh, metaphor in this case. So these are just some examples. Now, um, for emotion, uh, what we see here uh, is that, uh, you know, so for balance, uh, for instance, um, what we find is uh, very often when we see an improvement in the scores. Um, so again, we looked at you know cases where the score you know has become closer to what it should be, right? In in the case of multitask learning, as compared to single task learning, to see where where it improves. Um, and uh, and so for uh, for balance, uh, what we find is that the system is able to annotate um, metaphors that um, I should have. Uh, you know, either are explicit indicators of emotion uh, in a metaphorical sense, uh, or you know, in some way convey um, an implicit judgment um, or something like that. So, for instance, you know, scam lures victims with free puppy offer. It's a great sentence, um, and uh, and so here it annotates lure um, as a metaphor, um, which essentially is here uh, the judgment word, I guess that. Um, um, and so it becomes, uh, so the, uh, the balance score becomes a little bit lower and a little bit closer to the gold standard. And um, yes, yeah, so for, um, uh, for arousal, um, very often uh, we saw that metaphor 
uh, essentially would be would stand for some sort of a excitement indicator, you know, a word that's signaling excitement, so such as she's bewitchingly beautiful. Um, and so in that case, it uh, again helps to bring the score a bit closer to the gold score. And um, and then uh, for dominance, we did find some uh, interesting examples that you know. Um, indeed refer to power or lack of power in some way. So, such as, for instance, um, you know, feeling out of place. In fact, I've never felt so out of place in all of my life. Um, and, uh, or frustration rises as nuclear career, uh, sorry, as North Korean nuclear talks stall. So you're stalling. It's again, lack of um, control. And so the underlined expressions are the ones that uh, the metaphor model uh, in this disjoint model annotated as a metaphor. So, yeah. Okay, that's all I have on um, emotion. And I guess because we are approaching, well, perhaps I should stop here. I come back and talk the, about the other experiment another time. <laughs> or, or should I go briefly? I don't know. I know there's an excursion. Can you say like just a couple of Okay, I can say a, I can say a couple of words. Um, Sure, yeah, uh, it's, I just don't want to, um, yeah. you know, break the, the plan. Um, so here in this uh, second experiment, what we did is we experimented with um, uh, with brain imaging data. Uh, and uh, so this was a joint work with Vesna um, Kamis Jokic, who actually comes from here, from USC, and is now working uh, with me in Amsterdam. And um, so we had, um, um, so the, the data was collected using fMRI, and essentially subjects um, read uh, sentences where a verb was used either metaphorically or literally in context. And then um, what we did in this experiment is we uh, used uh, data-driven semantic models, so general purpose models like word embeddings and sentence representations to see um, you know, whether we can decode the patterns, uh, the brain activity patterns associated with these sentences, and whether we can see interesting differences you know, for um, metaphorical and literal language there. And, and so um, maybe I'll say just a few words. Are you guys generally familiar with like, how fMRI works and how the data is represented? It might be better just to say, like, can you do it? Okay, okay, I'll move on to the results. <laughs> well, I'll say a little bit about the models that we use here. So, in the in case of linguistic models, we um, use GLAV word embeddings and we used compositional models, um, um, a, an, addition, um, an addition model, so a bag of words model, and uh, also an LSTM, which was trained in natural language inference task to extract phrase representations. We also used um, visually grounded models where representations for words uh, in the sentences and, um, and uh, the, the whole phrases were um, learned from visual data. And then we used the multimodal models where basically, which was a concatenation of the linguistic and the visual models. So I will skip through how these are learned. I would be happy to share a draft of the paper if people are interested. Um, and I will take you uh, right to the results. And so what we have found, what, was, what were the, um, the interesting findings, so the interesting differences that we found, so first in terms of linguistic models. Uh, so we first used um, uh, two models, uh, two lexical models for the verb and the object in the phrase. And by the way, phrases were uh, all in the same grammatical form. So um, it was a pronoun, then a verb in the progressive, and then a nominal object. So for instance, uh, she's grasping the handle versus she's grasping the lecture or something like that, right? Uh, and so essentially what we modeled are the verb object phrases in, in, in um, in, um, stimuli. And uh, to do that, we used uh, word level models, the object and the verb. So this is just for word embeddings of the object and the verb. And uh, then we used their concatenation, we used addition, and we used the LSTM. So what we find is that for the literal phrases, we um, get a much higher uh, decoding accuracy um, with the verb model, whereas for the metaphor, we get a higher one. Um, 
with the object model. So this is quite interesting because what it suggests is that, you know, while when people are reading literal sentences, which more likely contain sort of the literal more common, you know, more primary sense uh, of the verb that, uh, you know, that they're kind of focusing on the verb more and sort of retrieving its meaning from memory or something like that, right? So I'm speculating here. Uh, whereas for metaphor, it looks like they're paying more attention to the object. Um, of the phrase, which may have something to do with the surprisal and the fact that they need to perform more disambiguation, right? So they need to they need to perform more processing, and the object becomes more important in interpretation of the phrase. So this is, you know, this is the first such result. It's, you know, it's too early to really claim anything about human processing on the basis of this, but it does show us, you know, some interesting possibilities and some interesting directions to explore further. Um, and then again, we also see that. You know, with compositional models um, that do contain the object are generally better than just the verb model in the metaphor case as well, which may suggest the same thing. So, okay. And yeah, addition somehow is generally better than the LSTM. Um, we don't really know why, but that's what we found. Uh, so, uh, another interesting finding is that uh, for the metaphor case, again, we found, so with visual models, we only found significant decoding accuracies um, using, uh, uh, only found significant decoding accuracies for metaphor, but not for literal. So, which was surprising to us at first, because we at first thought, okay, you know, maybe, you know, the, the literal sense is more physical, so we're more likely to be, you know, using our visual system to, you know, we can imagine it, more likely to be using our visual system to interpret it, but it turns out to not be the case, at least according to our results. And uh, it does indeed seem that, um, you know, when we're processing metaphor, uh, we are relying on visual information more, at least visual information can decode um, brain activity better. So it could have, again, something to do with the general difficulty uh, of processing metaphors as compared to uh, the literal language and um, and so generally, you know, if it is more difficult to process that it could be that we're using more of our brain systems to do this, um, including the visual system. It could have something to do with, um, uh, you know, with the, the imagery that is how it is ported across domains when we, you know, take um, a physical word and then try to interpret it in an abstract con uh, context. So anyway, the, the bottom line is we don't really know why this happens, but again, this is an interesting initial finding, which uh, you know could be investigated or should be investigated further. I think, and we see the same effect for the multimodal models. And yeah, these are my conclusions here, which I have pretty much already summarized. So there is still a little bit of time. I'd be happy to take questions or explain a little bit more on how decoding was actually done, or not. Okay. Any more questions? No questions. That was too quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did I say more? Should we, do we have to go? Probably, yeah. We go. Okay. Okay, great. So if you if you guys are interested in this work, feel free to send me an email, and uh, we are currently updating the draft of the paper based on the reviews. But uh, you know, we can once it's ready, we'd be happy to share that as well. Yeah. All right. See you. Yes. And you're not coming to the, the boat. Yeah. Okay. But I'm glad we got to talk. Well, take care. See you soon, hopefully. Uh, I have lots of questions, but we can talk about it. Sure, sure. Uh, Do you want yeah. to drop the stuff? Yeah, so that is the question, actually. I have a suitcase. Okay. Uh, and it's currently.